in Romans chapter number 6, if you want to be finding your place there. Romans chapter number 6. Last week I had started this, uh, this series I, I call the road signs uh, along the path of life or some, some signs along the path of life, something like that. And uh, there's a lot of different signs we can look at. I started with uh, basically a one-way sign or a narrow-way sign because uh, regardless of, of what the world will tell you, there are not many ways to get to heaven. There is but one way. And that one way is a narrow way. It is a constraining way, but there is freedom in knowing what the boundaries are, knowing uh, where the road lies. Uh, and, and so as we consider this, we, we talked about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. And we uh, looked at no man cometh unto the Father but by him. I don't know where anybody else could open that up any wider. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. He is the only way. There is no other. And we can't add works to it. We can't add other things to salvation. There is but one way of salvation. Uh, and, and we read that uh, we read this verse in Proverbs that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And there'll be many people that will say, it, it just feels so good. This seems like the thing to do. This seems like the way that I should go. But the Bible tells us if we're not doing what the, the Scripture lines out for us, if we're not following the Bible, then we're going the wrong way. We're doing the wrong things. And it may seem right, but the end thereof is destruction. We don't want to be on that path. Uh, and then we talked about how Jesus himself said, enter, in, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate that, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Uh, we may not be on a, on a path that is filled with other travelers, but Jesus gives us encouragement that if we're on the right path, there's not going to be a lot of traffic. We're, we're going to be following him. It's a narrow way. It's the only way. And don't doesn't matter if it seems right in your heart or not. We need to follow what Jesus has outlined for us. So that, that was last week, the, the sign, the one way or the narrow road sign. Uh, this evening, I'd like to, to talk about a, a second sign that we would come across along the roadway of life. And that is the yield sign. And uh, I've, I've read some uh, as I was studying for this sermon, and I was looking at different, different little stories and anecdotes. And uh, one man uh, had put out on the Internet a list of what he called his wife's driving tips, or what he titled them, insane driving tips. And uh, see, see if, this, if you recognize anybody in these. Uh, his wife says that speed limits are the minimum. If the sign says 70, it actually means it's acceptable to go 80. If it's raining, snowing, or you're passing through the eye of a hurricane, then you should probably only drive the sign or the speed posted on the sign. So 70 miles an hour unless. Uh, when she sees a merge sign, it means get out of her way. Stop signs, yield signs, and traffic lights are merely suggestions. So I don't know. Some of you are probably in the driver's seat, and some of you are in the passenger seat praying, but you probably all can relate uh, to, to somebody taking those signs. So uh, this evening, what I want to talk about is the yield sign. Webster's Dictionary defines yield to mean to give up a contest, to submit, to comply, to give way, not to oppose, to give place as inferior or, uh, or in inferior in rank or excellence. Now, a as we open with this thought then, we're looking at yield signs, and we're going to give way to another. Before I, I read our scripture here in Romans chapter 6, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this thought this evening, what we should yield to, what we shouldn't yield to, and then hopefully I'll give you a little challenge as we leave. Lord, uh, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for your word. And this evening, as we consider this passage in Romans, I, I do pray that the Holy Spirit will take and just open up our hearts and our minds, that it will stir our thoughts to think about things that we should yield to in this life, things that we should not yield to, and then, Lord, that we would be stirred into action. Uh, we live in a culture that's so passive and so uh, just sit back and let things go. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give us the discernment to know when we should act uh, and when we should yield. 
and then uh, the Lord just empower us to follow after your lead as I preach this this evening I do pray that uh, you'll just use my words let it be an encouragement to these that have come and I ask these things in Jesus name amen so a as you're traveling along the road of life a lot of things will come at you and uh, I know we, we had uh, somebody come and visit us uh, not too long ago and as they were driving down, they didn't have a GPS. They printed off paper maps. And uh, I was trying to tell them, I said, well, as you come down, you come down to 231, you'll get to Interstate 10. You want to make sure you get on Interstate 10 and head east. They're coming through Alabama, hitting 10, coming over. Uh, and about 10:30, 11 o'clock that night, we still hadn't heard from them. About 12 o'clock that night, they called, and they were in Panama City. Miss the turn. You know, it is easy sometimes to miss some signs along the road of life. And, and I think it's important for us to recognize the world tries to distract us. There's lots of things to see. There's lots of things trying to draw your attention away. We need to learn some of the signs that are really important. The one-way sign is our first. It's the step into getting on the right road. And this next sign I want to talk about is yield. Uh, and because there are some things that we are to yield to, and there are some things that we are not supposed to yield to. With that, let, let's look here in uh, Romans chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 11. The scripture says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof." Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God and those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, unto, or delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, as we think about this passage, again, you, you caught the, the key verse there is yield, do not yield yourselves to unrighteousness, neither yield your members uh, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. We have to understand what it is to yield. How many of you love roundabouts? Right? You know, we, we like some roundabouts. Well, roundabouts cause people a great deal of consternation. So you come traveling up there and you're going to hit that roundabout and you have to be watching because you can't occupy the same spot that somebody else is occupying in that roundabout. And when you come to the roundabout, you don't have to stop, but you are supposed to yield. And what yielding means then is that you will give up the contest. Uh, I was traveling down Capitol Circle this evening seen this big red four-wheel drive truck and he was coming up on the red light knowing it was going to turn green and he was just flying through there because he's going to cut everybody off at that uh, at those barrels if if you drive that big red truck shame on you uh, but no it wasn't anybody here uh, but but he wasn't going to yield he he is he is in a race he thinks it's the 500 uh, mile race around there and he's, he's got to be first position uh, and he's he's in a contest some people are in a contest and they say, I will not yield. I'm going to fight for that spot. Others, uh, th the thought would be to give way. You know, if somebody's coming, just let them take that spot. Is it really going to hurt you? You can catch them at the next light, make fun of them anyway. Uh, so you can give way. You don't have to oppose them or to give place. Sometimes we need to recognize some people need, need, uh, need to be given an advantage. Some, some people, let's lift, let them go ahead of us. Let's recognize. And some people uh, deserve a higher position than we do. Sometimes we have to recognize it's not that important that I get there. Somebody else may need, have a higher need. So when we talk about yielding, these are things that we can see. And I think it works real well in a roundabout. 
Because if you're both contesting to get to that same spot in a roundabout, you're going to crash, and then you're going to sit there and wait for the police and all the other things that go on. So we don't want to contest that. Uh, you don't want to oppose someone else. We don't need to be fighting, folks, uh, for, for our position. And, and then uh, we can let others go ahead of us. You know, I know a lot of young drivers, and uh, one, one, one person told me they just didn't like people being in front of them. You know, somebody's always going to be in front of you. You might as well just kind of get over that. And, and we have to learn to yield. So, so the scripture says uh, we need to yield. The scripture says there are some things we should not yield. Now, I want to focus on this, what we're not supposed to yield first. In chapter 6, verse number 1, Paul presents this rhetorical question. Now, if you read through the book of Romans, the book of Romans is, is, uh, is a message for today's people. Now, today's people don't want to hear it, but that still doesn't change the fact that it's a, uh, the message for today's people. Uh, they've gotten corrupt, and the uh, non-religious people were corrupt, the religious people were corrupt, the religious leaders were corrupt. It, it was a time of corruption, and Paul kind of calls them all out on it. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, uh, everyone is tending toward this corruption, and he's calling people uh, to recognize the fact, and then he's calling them to recognize if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've entered in on the one way, then it is time that you start living a certain life. We don't live this way to stay saved. We live this way because we are saved. We don't add works to salvation, but we are saved unto good works. And when he comes to chapter 6, verse number 1, he asks this rhetorical question. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall, that we, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And here, here's the question that the people were asking. He, Paul is making the point that the grace of God shines brighter and brighter in the face of sin. And as this world gets more and more sinful and more and more dark, the grace of God is brighter and brighter and shines brighter and brighter. And there are some in, in this church at Rome that Paul is writing to who think, well, if grace shines brighter in sin, well, then let's sin, that grace may be even greater. And Paul says, that, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not called to live like the rest of the world. We're called to be different. And, and that's where we get to this, this thought of uh, yielding. Uh, you and I are not to yield ourselves to our sinful past. You know, there are a lot of people that want to hold you back and say, well, you know, when, before you got saved, you did this thing. Well, you, you remember back when you were younger and you did this thing. Well, I heard you the other day. You got mad and you said this thing. And they want to take you and get you locked into your past and locked into the sins of your past. Now, those sins are there. That past is there. But God has forgiven you. And you do not need to yield to the sins of your past. Uh, but to do that... It's an active choice. You've got to choose to take a stand. You will not conquer sin by sitting around and just letting things happen. You have to take a stand. You have to make the decision. I will not yield, the, the verse 13 says, neither yield, you, you, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You have to make a conscious decision that I am not going to do what is sinful. I did in the past, but I'm not going to anymore. You say, well, I, I've been trying to do what's right, but yesterday, well, uh, every one of us is still going to face sin. But we're not supposed to yield, not supposed to give in. We are supposed to fight against this, uh, this sin that is ever present with us. We are not to comply we are not to give way. We are not to submit. We are to contest sin at every stage of our life. And we've got to make this an active plan. It's not easy. It's not natural. Uh, if, if you read back in uh, Genesis, we, we won't turn there because I won't have time. Uh, but, but Adam is sitting there beside Eve, and he is complicit and not protecting his wife from sin. He should have made an active choice to stand against what the serpent was saying because he was there with his wife 
when she was tempted and did nothing. And how many of us are guilty of sitting beside somebody and letting them choose to sin and we say nothing? We've got to make an active choice to uh, be against sin. We cannot yield. Uh, we're not supposed to yield to the sins of the past. We're also not supposed to yield to our lust. Look in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, I'm not naive. I don't think anybody in here is either. Sin, it, in, there is pleasure in sin for a season. If, if sin was not pleasurable, nobody would do it. If sin was like the flu, I mean, and it got you and it put you down, or sin was like, uh, I don't know, pick whatever terrible thing that you want it to be. If sin had the, these direct, uh, immediate, horrible consequences, we wouldn't sin. But sin seems pleasurable for a season. Sin can even seem right for a season. And you, you've talked with people. They'll justify their sin. And they'll say, well, I know the Bible says this, but. Well, I, I know you, you, you say I shouldn't do this. The church says I shouldn't do this. But it just it, it seems like the right thing. It sure feels good. It, it made me feel better. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But it's the wrong way. It's the wrong path. It will lead you to destruction. It will never deliver the pleasure that you're seeking. And... Uh, the, the Bible tells us that lust bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Uh, that's in the book of James. My, I had a youth pastor used to tell us that was the LSD of the Bible. Lust, sin, death. It's destructive. And if you give place to lust in your life, lust leads to sin, and sin will lead to death. You say, well, it won't lead to physical death. It, it can uh, it, it'll lead to spiritual death. It, it'll lead to sorrows that, like you cannot even imagine. Lust leads to sin. Sin leads to death. The Bible warns us of the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. And just because you get saved, you get saved Sunday morning. Well, well, well let, let's say Sunday night. Sunday night, evening church, you came forward and you got saved. Monday morning, all your lust were gone. All those sinful desires were gone. All those bad habits were gone. All those things that you've ever done erased from your memory and everything was just, you know, just gumdrops and lollipops, right? It was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you never had a problem since. That is not how life works. You have to make an active choice to not yield yourself to the sins of the past and you have to make an active choice not to yield yourself to those lusts. Your mind will work on you. Your mind builds these habits. And if you think on a, th on a thought long enough, you will take action on that thought. You think it, you obsess upon it, you act upon it. And we see this over and over, not only in the scriptures, this is just in, in real life. People start thinking about something and they think about it and they think about it and it leads to an action and that leads to an action and it leads to consequences. Lust bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Uh, and and uh, these lusts of the flesh, they are strong, they are there, but I would want you to recognize that they're not all powerful. I, I liken them more to terrorists. Everybody's heard of the, the terrorists, and we were fighting terrorism here and terrorism there, and we got terrorist attacks here and terrorist attacks there. Uh, things going on in Israel, very, very disturbing and upsetting. But, you know, those things are real. They're there, but we can fight against them. We can prepare ourselves. We can be on guard against them. And, and it may give you a setback. You, you think about the, these uh, attacks going on. Uh, it's going to cause a little bit of discomfort. It, it may injure people. It may, it's some that, that might even die from this. But you know, they're, they're terrorists. They're not going to win the war. It's just a skirmish. It's just a small attack. And while it's devastating on those that it's affecting, recognize this, that's not the end of the battle. And you and I are called then to fight against, to not yield to lust. It would be foolish to just give up. We've got to take active 
uh, or make active decisions and uh, take uh, choices that will keep the terrorist at bay. Verse number 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So we're not going to yield ourselves to the sins of the past. We're not going to uh, yield ourselves to the lust. And we are not going to yield our bodies to be members of unrighteous or instruments of unrighteousness. Again, that sin starts with a thought. So if you obsess on that thought, it becomes action. And Satan can use your hands, your feet, your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness. Even as a Christian, you can say things that are hurtful and mean. You, you can do things that are hurtful and mean. You can walk places, go places that are hurtful and, and mean. And we are not to yield our bodies instruments of unrighteousness. We've got to oppose that. I, I, I kept thinking of this verse with Paul today, and I, I didn't write it in my notes. And I can't quote it right, but he says, The good that I would, that I do not, and the, the evil that I would not, that I do. And he says, I'm fighting with this flesh. I want to do what's good. I want to do what's right. But my flesh is fighting against me. And I'm in this constant battle of trying to do what's right. And I will not yield my body to be an instrument of unrighteousness. He's made an active, conscious decision. I will not yield. You and I are in a fight. Some of us, we get up in the morning, right? And we're fighting the old age. Uh, some, what is it? Somebody said we gather ourselves together. Gather the hearing aid, the false teeth, the glasses, uh, the wh whatever else it is, right? We, we, we're trying to put ourselves all back together, trying to get things going. But you and I, every morning when we get up, we need to be prepared to battle against our flesh and not the aches and pains of just growing and getting older, but fighting against this flesh because the devil wants to destroy you. He is out to get you, and if he can use you as an instrument of unrighteousness, he can't take away your salvation, but he can destroy your testimony. He can't take away your salvation, but he can, he can make it so you're no good to lead anyone else to Christ. We've got to be on guard against that. We cannot yield our members. Um, I'll skip on down here. Let's, uh, we are, what are we supposed to yield? We are supposed to yield unto God that new life. Verse 13, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You and I were dead in the trespasses of sin. Sin had put the death penalty on us. We were in bondage unto death. But when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we are raised from death unto life. It's a new life. You ever see somebody and something tragic has happened in their life and, and they make this sudden change? And you talk to them and say, well, what's going on? And they say, you know what I realized? I wasn't doing what was right. I wasn't doing what was important. And, and this incident, whatever it was, the loss of the job, loss of health, loss of family member, whatever it might have been, they said, that instant put a whole new light on things for me. And I am no longer going to be the person I was. I'm going to yield my life unto God as an instrument of righteousness. He's going to have my hands. I will do what he wants me to do. He will have my feet. I will take the gospel where he wants me to take it. He will have my tongue. I will speak the words of encouragement. He will have my mind. I will not fill it with the stuff of this world, but I will fill it with the word of God and the wisdom of God that I may be a blessing to people so I can show them how they can know the same God that I know. This is what we are to do, not to yield ourselves unto unrighteousness, but yield ourselves to God as those that have been made alive from the dead. And that's our testimony. Each and every one of us has been raised from the dead. We didn't deserve it, but God did it anyway. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You know, I do not have to be ruled by sin. I have pledged my allegiance to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He is my ruler. Sin has no dominion over me. Dominion means somebody can tell you what to do. Somebody can control your actions. Sin has no dominion over the Christian. You with me on this one? 
It has no dominion. The only time sin can take dominion over you is when you allow it to. And you have to make the choice. I know it's sin, but I know the Bible says I shouldn't, but we're not to give sin dominion. We have a new king, a new ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he has given us freedom from the sins of the past, and he will give us the power to uh, defeat sin in our lives, but we've got to make the choice to follow him. Uh, let, let's look, there's also a new purpose. The, the old, old life and the old body was used as an instrument of unrighteousness. We did what we wanted, when we wanted, because we wanted. But the new life is an instrument of righteousness. We are doing what God would have us to do. And you say, well, when I got saved, I really wasn't that bad of a person. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, we need to recognize who our enemy is and declare it. We are in a battle against sin. We are in a battle against the forces of this world. We're in a battle against the lust of the flesh, the uh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it is if, if we fall in with them, we become an enemy of God. What a terrible state for anyone uh, to be in. But we've been raised from the dead of sin into newness of life. And we can make the choice then not to give sin that power and dominion. Romans 6, 17, the scripture says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Each and every one of us, we were servants of sin. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been delivered. You've been enlisted into this fight and we do not have to yield our bodies to sin because we are yielding our bodies to our Savior. It, if you've never asked Christ to save you, I, I'd encourage you to do so. That, that's the, the most important thing you can do. That gets you on the one way. And once you get on the one way, we've got to figure out there's some things to yield to and some things not. Let's not yield to the sins of the past. Let's not yield our bodies to be instruments of unrighteousness. And let's be sure to yield to the will and the word of God. Let's do what he's called us to do. And there are blessings that we can have, blessings that are untold. Uh, 